format for our Lent mission this year. It actually takes place over a number of days. Um, we're devoting our mission to uh, four very holy men. And in each one of our nights of the mission, um, you'll hear a little bit about them. In your mission program book, um, we'll begin with our, our first, uh, soon, hopefully soon to be saint for the day, Blessed Father Stanley Rother. Um, our order of worship will be, we'll sing a hymn to put us all in the presence of God. And then I will introduce to you Monsignor Andrew Baker, who I'll just mention a little bit about in a couple more minutes. When Monsignor's finish his presentation, we will do the, um, the Novena Prayer, which is day one, found on the second page, from uh, the Bishop, Archbishop Conley, uh, Father Stanley, and then we'll go back to the first page, where we'll do the prayer for canonization and for his intercession. And at the conclusion of that, we are very fortunate that um, outside of the seminary community, we will be one of the first people to actually be able to venerate the relic of uh, Father Stanley Rother. I know most of you have never heard of the guy before. Uh, and I didn't know about it until I went to Mount St. Mary's. So, uh, Monsignor Baker has worked feverishly since becoming the rector to help promote the cause and to educate himself. Um, if any of you are a great big EWTN fan, uh, Father had a special on EWTN on Father Stanley, and I know that you can go to their catalog and download it if you'd like to watch it on DVD. Uh, tonight you're going to be hearing an awful lot about Mount St. Mary Seminary, and I will say that with no shame. Um, I don't want to steal any of Monsignor Baker's thunder of the seminary, but he is the rector, and he is one of our own from the diocese. Uh, Mount St. Mary's is the oldest seminary in the United States. No, two. Two. St. Mary's Roman Park. Mea culpa, mea culpa. You know, uh, they... Uh, we're number two, we're the second oldest seminary, but we are the largest seminary in the country. And we've held that distinction since the seminary's founding, believe it or not. Uh, they call Mount St. Mary's the cradle of bishops uh, because of the number of bishops that have been ordained uh, from Mount St. Mary's. And just recently, um, we've added a new bishop to that uh, from the Diocese of Harrisburg. Scranton. Scranton, Scranton, yeah. Um, so uh, Scranton, before that was Harrisburg. So it's the cradle of bishops. Uh, one of the things that, I guess you have to be at the Mount to be able to appreciate it. Maybe someday we'll take a bus trip. But there's a certain atmosphere there of tranquility, of holiness, but also the presence of God. And uh, that's something that I felt very much in love with. But one of the reasons why Mount St. Mary's is such a popular seminary is because it just doesn't rest on its laurels. It's always looking to better itself. In the past, the seminary was to form priests, and it's still a big part of seminary formation. But the Mount realizing that because of the shortage of priests, the fact that a guy might only be a couple of years ordained before they name him a pastor. You know, I was ordained almost 15 years before, you know, they even looked at me for a pastorship. But now it can happen very quickly. So the Mount is one of the very first seminaries to come up with a program to educate pastors and to help them prepare for a lot of the uh, things that they have to go through. You know, parish management and accounting and many, many different topics 
that a pastor has to face that the seminary never prepared most of our priests for. They're one of the few seminaries that, seminaries that still do it. They're a trend center. One of the other things that Mount St. Mary's uh, has done in recent years, right before Monsignor Baker went there as rector, but a tradition that he has continued, and I'm envious that I was not there in these later days, but they really believe that before the deacon class leaves the seminary, they take a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And it's a priestly focus experience of walking where Jesus walked and smelling the smells that Jesus smelled and experiencing that whole climate. And our men have really come back so much pastorally and spiritually renewed along with all the other dimensions that uh, Mount St. Mary's brings. So uh, we can keep our seminarians and faculty of Mount St. Mary's in our prayers tonight and uh, I'll make a shameless plug for uh, Monsignor Baker tonight uh, is the fact that you know, uh, there's less and less financial resources to keep the seminaries going. And so maybe in your prayers, if you want to make some sort of Lent sacrifice, if you'd like, you can see me and I'll make sure that uh, he gets something, okay? Um, so I'll explain a little bit about why we're going to talk about the mount. We explained a little bit about the book. There's also a holy card with Father Stanley's picture on it that has the colored border. That also has the prayer of canonization around it. And remember my homily on Ash Wednesday and the first Sunday in Easter, or first Sunday in Lent. Don't worry about giving up something this year. Make your Lenten resolution to pray for the canonization of one of these three men in front of us. Now, maybe you want to pray for all three of them. Maybe you just want to focus in on somebody else. Uh, you know, the diocese just got done that cooks for collars thing. So maybe what we could do is we could have something here. If you really like Monsignor Baker's talk, you're going to talk, pray for Father Rother. You know, if you really like Father Ritz's talk and Walter Chiswick, you can still pray for Father Rother. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so there's that. But anyway, um, without Further ado, just one more little thing. Um, on senior Andy Baker, um, he was born in 1965. He was the seventh of 12 children uh, to uh, Bill and Elizabeth Baker. Uh, he grew up in, Kutz, uh, in Coopersburg. He attended Allentown Central Catholic High School. Uh, he has a very profound distinction because he is his eldest brother, the first of the family, is also a Monsignor Baker, Monsignor Bill Baker. And they are, I guess, the only brothers that are priests in our diocese now until the idols really get together uh, and get ordained, hopefully, both of them, Keaton uh, and Colby. Uh, but isn't it a blessing that? Uh, family was able to turn two sons over to God, you know, uh, to be priests. Uh, he was ordained in 1991 by our very own Bishop Welsh, who spent a lot of time in this church and visiting many people here with his sister. Um, he then went off to uh, St. Charles Seminary, where he did his undergrad and his graduate work. Uh, he was ordained. His first assignment was St. Thomas More, one of the more active parishes in the diocese. And then uh, he was given the opportunity to attend the, uh, the University of Navarre in Pompeii, Spain, where he got his doctorate in moral theology. Uh, and his doctoral dissertation was on contraception, two diverse approaches. So, uh, Monsignor is very much into the pro-life scene and very much someone that we turn to a lot for moral theology questions and also the seminary, the, for, the focus of our seminarians. Um, he actually taught at St. Charles Seminary for a while. Uh, he then uh, went 
back to Rome, where he worked with a congregation for bishops and spent a number of years in Rome. But while he was in Rome, he also taught in the major seminaries of Rome. And then he came back to the diocese, became rector of the cathedral. And then uh, in 2009, uh, his services with the diocese, he was asked if he would become the rector of Mount St. Mary's, and he's been there ever since. So we're very proud and very happy to have two of our native sons with us tonight, uh, the Baker brothers, and uh, to hear Monsignor talk a little bit tonight on Blessed Stanley Rothbard. So uh, what we will do is uh, we'll begin to put ourselves in the presence of God uh, by singing from the Credo book, hymn number 191, Remain With Me. Rother here, right? 
I was calling in Rothler as well until I, I picked up the phone at the very beginning of my time at the mound and I called the secretary in his home parish, Holy Trinity Parish in Okarchi, Oklahoma. And I said, how do you pronounce his last name? And she said, oh, Monsignor, it's Rother. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I pronounce it Rother. But, so I tried to get used to calling it Rother. Whichever way you pronounce it, it's the same person. Right? You'll hear me say Rother a little bit more because I've just gotten accustomed to it. Um, what I'd like to do first to kind of introduce Blessed Stanley and his life is show you a two, two and a half minute video which goes through his life rather quickly. Then I want to unpack his life for you and give you some insight into how I think Blessed Stanley can be an example for every one of us to live a holy life as a disciple of Jesus Christ. So the first thing I'm going to show you this video, I must tell you right away that it is a blatant advertisement from Mount St. Mary's Seminary. <laughs> that's, that's why we actually put it together. But we, we, we kind of uh, advertise the seminary by way of showing one of its graduates. Um, and so the Gloucester had said that we, we often call the Mount the Cradle of Bishops, and that is very true. Fifty-three of our graduates have gone on to become bishops. But after Blessed Stanley Rother was beatified and they became blessed, they started calling the mound also the cradle of saints. And I do believe that even though they may not have been recognized as saints throughout our over 200 year history, we have we've produced many priests who are saints in heaven. So we are not only the cradle of bishops, but also now have become the cradle of saints. So again, let me show you this uh, video. Um, You'll notice that the, the person presenting it looks a little familiar. <laughs> Hello, I'm Monsignor Andrew Baker, Rector of Mount St. Mary Center. The Mount has formed leaders in the church for more than 200 years. Today, seminarians are keepers of the flame that began with Father John Dubois in 1808, a flame that is carried on by Archbishop John Hughes, John Carter McCluskey, and Father Flanagan, among others. It is also home to Father Stanley Rofer, the first American-born martyr. Father Rofer graduated from the Mount in 1963 and was ordained for the Diocese of Oklahoma City, Tulsa. In 1968, he joined a group of Catholic missionaries in the Central American country of Guatemala, where he worked with the Sutherlands, an indigenous people suffering from extreme poverty. In the summer of 1981, he was killed in the church's rectory by three men believed to be members of an extremist death squad associated with the corrupt Guatemalan government. Archbishop Harry Flynn was a deacon at Mount St. Mary's, and Father Wilford arrived. The two men became close friends, and Flynn, who became seminary rector, stayed in contact with Father Rover throughout the rest of his life. He said terrible things are happening to the Indian people in Guatemala. Violent civil unrest forced Father Rover to leave Guatemala. He came to the mount for a retreat. And while here, he discerned he was called to return to his people despite the danger. If I go back and speak, they'll kill me. But if I keep silent, what kind of a shepherd would I be? And at the end of the week, he said, I know what I must do. I must speak. As he put it, a shepherd cannot run. It is a joy to be part of a seminary that holds such an extraordinary place in the history of the church. I am continually in awe of the grace God has given me to lead such a place and to prepare the next generation of men to lead the church in the third millennium of Christianity. Please know that our doors are always open for you. God bless. Hello. Shameless advertisement for the seminary. 
but it does give you at least the beginning of a taste of what his life was like and who Blessed Stanley Rother is. So let's, let's take a moment now to drill down into his life. Blessed Stanley Rother was born on March 27, 1935. He was the eldest of four children of a faithful Catholic farming family in Okarchi, Oklahoma. He was baptized two days later. Now remember, this is 1935, so the priests at that time had really a, a lot of power. He said to his parents, I can't baptize your child, Stanley. They were shocked. He said, well, he's your oldest. I have to name him after the father, whose name was Francis Franz. So believe it or not, even though the parents wanted to name him Stanley Francis Rother, he was baptized. He was baptized, I'm sorry, they wanted him Stanley Francis. He was baptized Francis Stanley Rother. And that is still on his baptismal certificate that we have at the Mount. It becomes significant because later on in his life, even though his name was Stanley, even though the family went back to calling him quietly Stanley, even though he was baptized Francis, when he got down to Guatemala, the people of his parish couldn't pronounce Stanley very well. So they were native Mayans that spoke a language, many of them called Zutuhil, and they also knew Spanish. So they started calling him Padre Francisco, Francis, or Aplas, which is the Zutuhil name for Francis. They actually went back to his baptismal name because that's, how, that's the name they could pronounce. So if you go down to Guatemala today, they'll speak of Padre Francisco, or Aplas, Aplas, even though his name is Stanley. So he's baptized two days later in the parish church in Okarchi, Holy Trinity Parish. He, like most of the parishioners at the time, the young you know, children, went to the, the, the parish school, which was um, grade school and high school together, all the way to the 12th grade. Stan began working in the, the family farm. He was the eldest, and everyone thought, what? Well, he would take over the family farm. Throughout high school, he's involved with an organization called the FFA, the Future Farmers of America. He is driving a tractor by age 10. He learns, as a young boy, how to fix just about anything. And this will become important as we move later into his life. One of his younger brother, brothers, Tom, says this. He says, there wasn't anything that Stan wouldn't tackle. He could pretty much fix just about anything. That's what her brother Tom said. So, as I said, he's very much involved with the family farm, learning how to take over the farm. However, in his senior year of high school, his younger sister, who was a year younger than him, Betty May, announces to the family that she wants to, instead of finishing high school, go off to the convent and become a nun. She's now called Sister Marita. She's still living, and I, I've met her. At that point, Stan, along with his sister, and she didn't even know he was going to do this, comes forward and says to his parents, I want to go to the seminary. His father said to him, Stan, that's fine, that's great, it's wonderful, you want to go up to the seminary, but why have you, throughout your high school years, been involved with the Future Farmers of America and not studying Latin? Because the Latin studies in high school were preparing people to go off into college, and Stan, at least at the beginning, did not expect or nor want to enter into college or the seminary. So Stan still is determined to follow what God wants him to do and enters the seminary. But remember, this is the 1950s. And in the seminaries at the time, many of the textbooks, including some instruction, was in Latin. Stan hadn't ever studied Latin. So could you imagine, how many of you know Latin? Enough to read it, to know. Could you imagine? going off to a, a school studying philosophy and theology in a language you don't know. That's what Stan had to face. Right? 
So, he goes off first to St. John's Preparatory Seminary for the first two years, and then finishes his college seminary at a place called Assumption Seminary in San Antonio, Texas. Now, his journey was filled with a lot of academic struggles. He had to repeat the first year of philosophy. He barely passed the second year of philosophy. And then he went on to theology, and the first semester of theology, he flunked just about every course that he took. They allowed him to return for the second semester, but five days into the second semester, the rector and professors come to stand and say, you're out. You have flunked the first semester, you have struggled too much, you're no longer in the center. However, his bishop, Bishop Victor Reed, believed in Sam. He believed he had a vocation to the priesthood. He saw so much good in him. So Bishop Reed said, listen, I know the rector at Mount St. Mary's. <laughs> I'm going to send you east to go to Emmitsburg, Maryland, and to study there. Now, the rector at the time of the George Volcani was a Latin teacher. So Stan arrives, and what does the rector do? He tutors him. His classmates say, don't worry, Stan. We've got some of these textbooks already translated into English. We'll help you. So, he moves to Emmitsburg, Maryland, has to begin his four years of theological studies over again, but he steadily improves in his academics. Father John Vesey of the Diocese of Brooklyn, who graduated, was with, was with Stan um, when he was a deacon, Stan was a deacon in 1963. Uh, Father Beth Vesey was a, a younger the seminarian at the time. He eventually takes over um, Blessed Stanley Rother's spot in, in Guatemala three years after he's martyred. But he said this about Stan. He said, Stan's Latin was weak in the seminary. And he appeared to us younger students as a deacon who suffered with his studies. But his gentleness spoke volumes to all of us. His gentleness spoke volumes to all of us. So, Stan enters the seminary, as I said, at the Mount. He's able to get through. I've had the opportunity to look at his formation file, we call it, and I can see how very gradually his, his grades began to improve. He entered Mount St. Mary's in 1959, graduated and was ordained in 1963, and you can see just how gradually, very slowly but surely, his grades get a little bit better. He finally is able to um, Petition for Holy Orders, Yaket, and then the priesthood. And he moves on then back to his home diocese, uh, which was at that time called Oklahoma City slash Tulsa. It was a diocese at that time that uh, encompassed the entire state of Oklahoma. Today there are two dioceses, Oklahoma City and Tulsa, the two different dioceses, the large diocese of Oklahoma City and Tulsa. But back then they were one diocese and it covered the entire state. He's ordained on May 25th, 1963. On his ordination card, do you know when a priest is, is ordained, they often have a little holy card. Have you seen it? Did you have any? Maybe you've maybe gotten one at, at one point or another. Well, Father Rother put his ordination card together, and on it he included a little quote that's based on a quote from St. Augustine. He put on his ordination card, quote, For myself, I'm a Christian. For the sake of others, I'm a after being an associate pastor in several parishes, in 1968, he requested to go down to Guatemala to help in the parish that was being sponsored at that time by the diocese. So the diocese of Oklahoma City slash Tulsa, the whole state of Oklahoma, all the Catholics, were supporting a particular parish 
with not only financially, but with priests and sisters, and some lay people would go down for several months to assist in this parish uh, in a little town called Santiago Atitlan in, in, in Guatemala. So in 1968, he joins the staff down in the mission in Santiago Atitlan, Guatemala. There he's serving a group of people called the Zutu Hills. They're related, I think, to the Mayans, um, and they knew Spanish, but some of them knew better their own native language. There's only, uh, at that time, only about 3,500 people in the world that understood this Mayan language, Mayan rooted language called Zutu Hill. So he's, he's ministering among the people of Santiago Atitlan that mainly speak Zutu Hill and some Spanish. Uh, he learns both Spanish and Zutu Hill, which I'm told, I have no idea, I don't know anything about Zutu Hill. But I understand it's a very complicated language. It's an ancient Indian language in South America. Now, remember, remember this was a guy who had trouble learning Latin from a farm family in Oklahoma. Think of the great love and zeal that he had to push himself to learn another language, both Spanish and Zutu Hill. Not only that, but with the help of a priest, translate the New Testament into Zutu Hill. We have a copy with them out. And that's it's incredible. What are they, think of the incredible zeal and love that he had for his people. Well, he served in Guatemala from 1968 through the 70s, eventually becoming pastor of the parish. At that time, there was a civil war being raged between militarist government forces and guerrilla forces. And the Catholic Church at that time was caught kind of in between because it insisted on supporting the poor and educating the poor, catechizing the poor, making them more and more independent. And at that time, a communist leading government did not like the fact that the people were independent or self-reliant. So, eventually, death squads from forces related to, to the government started to capture people that were considered to be leaders in the community. And loved ones didn't find their bodies until many days later, well outside of town, after they had been beaten and eventually killed. Father Rother knew of a number of his own parishioners, including a man who had been uh, one of his major catechists, and, and a father of a family who had been dragged out of town by these militarist guerrilla groups, beaten to death, and left outside, and his family didn't find him for many, many days later. Eventually, Father Rother discovers that his name is on one of these black lists these lists of the death squad. In 1980, he writes this in a letter around Christmas time back to the people of, of Oklahoma. He says, quote, The shepherd cannot run at the first sign of danger. Pray for us that we may be a sign of the love of Christ for our people, that our presence among them will fortify them to endure those sufferings in preparation for the coming of the kingdom. He knew his life was being threatened. He knew that if he continued to speak and to be with his people, he could end up like his catechist. So, in 1980, Father Rother, as the video mentioned, comes back to the United States primarily for the ordination of his cousin, Father Rolf, Wolf. And he comes back to Mount St. Mary's to go on retreat. His bishop told him, Stan, I know that your name is on this blacklist, that you could be martyred. I don't want you to return to Guatemala, but I'm not going to put you under obedience. You have to decide whether or not you want to go back. He goes to Mount St. Mary Seminary and takes a five-day quiet retreat. As you saw, Archbishop Flynn was rector at the time. And so he would meet Stan usually at the dinner time and talk a little bit with him. And at the end of that five days, Archbishop Flynn drove him back to the airport. 
And it was then that Blessed Stanley Rother said, I now know what I must do. One of his classmates that I, I met this past summer said that they also came to see Stan, Blessed Rother, at the seminary. And he was very clear with his classmates that if he returned, he thought for sure he would be killed. He returns in time for Holy Week to his people in Santiago, Atala. Several months later, in July 1981, he's martyred. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about that day, that day of martyrdom at the end. So what I'd like to do now is just talk a little bit about some characteristics of his life that I think all of us, all those that have been baptized, all of us that are disciples of Jesus Christ, all of us that treasure our Catholic faith, can live in our life in order to be a saint. Maybe not a bloody martyr, or even canonized, but nevertheless, a saint, a holy person here and now with heaven in our future. So, allow me to, uh, to just describe a little bit of these characteristics of uh, Blessed Stanley Rofer in terms of what we in seminary work call the four dimensions of formation. You probably never heard of that, did you? It's just four dimensions of who we are as human beings that we concentrate on in the, semina in the seminary's formation to become a priest. His human dimension, his intellectual life, his pastoral life, and his spiritual life. Right? So I'm going to use those four to also highlight several qualities of the life of Blessed Stanley Brother that I think stand out and that also you and I can imitate. Right? You don't have to be seminarians to become a priest to imitate his life of Blessed Stanley Brother. The first thing that I want to mention is a virtue in this human dimension, and that's what the human, human formation is about, virtue formation is the virtue of obedience. Obedience. You know, not just priests have to be obedient to their bishop, right? Those husbands, don't you know, you know you better be obedient, right? <laughs> half the time you're wrong, and the other half the time she's right. <laughs> right? Right? So obedience is part of our life. Right? Whether it's married life, family life, living in society, and also ultimately obeying the will of God. In our life. That was the food that Jesus says in the gospel for him, obeying the will of the Father. Blessed Stanley Rother was a fine example of this virtue. First, he listened to his bishop when his bishop said to him, Go east to Mount St. Mary's. Blessed Stanley could have given up and said, You know what, Bishop, forget it. They threw me out of Assumption Seminary. I'm going home and I'm going to take over the family farm. No, he listened to his bishop. His bishop saw something in him. He saw a vocation of the priesthood. And so he went east to a place where he had never been before, Mount St. Mary's Seminary. When he arrived there, he was told by the rector and some of the priest formators, listen, Stan, we know that in your previous seminary, since you were so good at all those mechanical things, you ended up doing a lot of work, physical work around that seminary, and maybe you didn't have enough time to, to concentrate on your studies. So we want you to obey and cut back on some of your extracurricular activities and concentrate a little more time on your studies. He did it. In his formation file that we have at the Mount, there's a little card that he filled out. The rector had asked him to, to tell him and write out the activities that he was doing. Right? And he, he wrote those things out to make sure he wasn't doing too many things, wasn't fixing too many things, wasn't trying to pull up too many stumps of trees or, 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 or to fix someone's chair or, or whatever, paint something. He used to do that all the time in his previous seminary. But his rector said, no, Stan, cut back and put a little more time in your studies. And it worked because Stan obeyed. For his first four years as a priest, he had four different assignments. Imagine that. Year's over, right, we want you to go to another parish. Right after that year, go to another parish. After that year, go to another parish. He obeyed. He went. When he heard the call from God to go down to Guatemala, he approached his bishop and led it up to his bishop to decide. 
I'd like to go, but left him to his hand of his bishop. And his bishop said, yes. For you and I, <clears throat> life takes a lot of twists and turns that we never expected. That's what makes life so interesting. But we have to learn, all of us, to stop trying to write our own autobiography, wanting life to go along the way I want it to be. That's not what Blessed Stanley Rofer did. Indeed, we have a tendency to want to draw our own map of our life, don't we? We want things to go the way we want them to go. But it doesn't always happen that way. And sometimes the best thing to do is to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And let's listen to others as instruments of God. Yes, I will then. We have to let go sometimes of our preferences as stand in. We have to let go of thinking that we know better. Obedience as a virtue is more meritorious and valuable precisely when we don't agree when we don't want to do something, but do it out of obedience. Haven't we learned that during COVID? Another, another great virtue of his is, is I would call his, his poverty, his, his dispossession of things. He didn't allow things to run his life. We live in a very consumeristic society, don't we? In the United States of America, we are really spoiled. We are. Consumerism and materialism uh, is kind of the philosophy of our age. How did Blessed Stanley Wilther live his life? Well, this is from one of his biographers. He wore his clothing until his elbows were sticking out and his shoes were cobbled over. When he was in Guatemala, his lifestyle, his clothing, his eating habits, it was not his own. It was that of the, the Zutu Hill Indians. He provided a very detailed account of all the money that he had received from the people in Oklahoma and how he used it at the mission. He would send home uh, a financial report in which he would say, this is how much money you've given me in donations and this is how I spent it, right down to the last penny. We have records of it, right down to the last penny. He included things like the automatic voltage regulator that he bought, whatever that means, I have no idea. Um, he said, gas is now $2 for regular, which was very expensive in those days, right? But he listed everything and everything that he used it for. Simplicity of life or poverty gives us the flexibility and reliance on God's grace that is indispensable for a holy life. And each of us has to live that simplicity of life according to our own vocation, our family situation, the duties in life, our profession. But Stanley teaches us how to possess things and not have things possess us. That's a virtue that all of us can and should live as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Finally, another virtue is his charity, his great love. The example I have of this is uh, something that I've never seen written, but I learned after I called one of his classmates. Um, I called one of his classmates to find out where Blessed Stanley lived in Mount St. Mary's Seminary. And his classmate said, I know exactly where he lived. I wanted to put a plaque on the door. And he said, well, tell me, where did he live? He says, well, you know, you, you come into McSweeney Hall, you take a right, you go up that stairwell all the way up to the fourth floor, you take a right, and there's a bathroom, a hallway bathroom right there. I said, yes, that's right, there still is. He says, well, Stanley lived two doors down from there. He said, this is going back to the early 1960s. I said, how do you know that? He says, it's real simple, he said. He said, you see, the room right next to the bathroom was mine. <coughs> Because I was a sound sleeper. And anytime any of the guys would come into the bathroom at late at night and flush and maybe take a late shower or something, it didn't wake me up at all. It never disturbed me. There was only one problem. Guess what it is? I couldn't get up in the morning. That's how sound a sleeper I was. 
And I know where Stan lived because he lived in the room right next to mine. Every morning, he would come out of the hallway, bang on my door, and wake me up. That's how I know where he lived. A simple act of charity. Stan was not thinking of himself, but trying to get his work classmate, who was a sound sleeper, up in time for mass in the morning. That's charity. That's charity, maybe in a very small scale, but he did it every day, consistently, faithfully. It became a mark for his whole life. Think of your life and mine. Those little acts of charity that await us every single day. Maybe it is nudging someone you know, to wake them up. Maybe it's a kind visit to someone in a nursing home. Little acts of charity in the supermarket. There's so many ways in which we, like us at Stanley, can do those small acts that amount to great love. Okay. So that's kind of his, a little, a little bit about his, his humanity, his, the human dimension of Blessed Stanley that can be an example for us. Briefly, I want to talk about his intellectual life. The seminarians are more interested in this than, than you might be, because they're studying all the time. But just to keep in mind that for Stan, even though, even though he, he struggled with Latin, he was a very bright man, very bright, maybe more a practical intellect than a speculative one. But still, still, he was a very bright man. As I said, he did struggle a lot with his, his studies. Um, however, when he gets down to Guatemala, what happens? You can see his full intellectual life come alive because he wants to teach other people the faith. He preached in a language that was not his own. He actually formed catechists, dozens if not hundreds of them over the years, to be able to go out into his rather large territory of his parish in order to continue the catechesis of people up in the mountains and in far-reaching areas of his parish in Santiago Atitlan. It's just a sign to us that we too should not disregard our, our, our desire to know more about Christ and about our Catholic faith. So often, it's been my experience as a priest that we have some wonderful Catholic people whose intellectual life and understanding of the faith is back in the third grade, or the last time they were in Catholic school. Our minds are an important part of our faith. In learning the Church's teaching and our Lord's saving doctrine, we are then not only better Catholics ourselves and know our faith better, but it makes us more capable then of passing that faith on to others. Someone once said to me that, you know, the Catholic faith in any area in the world is one generation away from disappearing. If you think about it, if the present generation in a particular place doesn't pass on the faith to the next generation, it disappears. If we're not catechizing, educating, helping the next generation love Christ, know the scriptures, know the saving doctrine of the church, if that's not happening, the faith weakens and could disappear. So our intellectual life is important. Stan knew that. He struggled with philosophy and theology, but he got through it. And he continued his own intellectual formation as a priest. Stan knew that his studies were not simply about the grades, but about his ability to teach the faith to others. Well, you and I also have that same responsibility, not as a priest or religious sister, but you as a, as a lay person, in your own family, among your own friends. We too have to take seriously our intellectual life. Then there is um, what I would call his missionary spirit, which is what I, in terms of the seminarians, I, I call it their pastoral formation, right? Um, but even though for seminarians we're preparing them to become pastors, still every baptized Catholic has a missionary duty to spread the faith. Right? 
When Christ says to his disciples, go out to all, all nations and baptize them, and others, he was giving that commission to everybody within your own particular vocation and way of life. Stan had a particular zeal, a missionary zeal, that brought him down to Guatemala. You or I may not have that particular call, but nevertheless, we ought to have the same zeal. When, um, after his ordination, he went down to this, this parish, and remember that this parish had been in existence since the 16th century. It was established by Spanish missionaries. So he was entering into a pastoral situation in a parish that had been around for a long time. Yet he doesn't sit on his laurels. He writes a letter back to uh, Monsignor Harry Flynn, who eventually becomes Archbishop Harry Flynn. He writes a letter back to him uh, in the, the late the 70s and describes his pastoral work. And he says that this past year, he's married 68 couples at one mass. He has given 305 first communions. And the average for that year of baptisms in his parish was 600 to 700 children. In a Christmas letter in 1980, published in the Catholic newspaper Oklahoma, he wrote about the incredible efforts that they had been making in catechesis, the celebration of the sacraments, the renovation of the church, the construction of a parish hall. He founded a radio station and a small clinic, hospital clinic. Now at the same time, he also writes about 10 men who had disappeared. This is 1980, the year before he's martyred. And he says that he was given a nice compliment when someone said, Father is defending the people. Then he said a man had told him that the government wanted to deport him. He also found that to be a great compliment. Blessed Sandy Rother wrote, this is one of the reasons I have for staying in the face of physical harm. The shepherd cannot run at the first sign of danger. This is one of the reasons he stays, precisely because his life is being threatened. And yet his zeal causes him to love his people so much that he's willing to lay down his life for them. We can also see his zeal in some things that uh, the people who knew him well talk about him. Uh, one of his, his cousin, Father Tom Wolf, uh, said this about his cousin, Pastor Stanley Rother. He says, um, when he was home in 1980, he told me that if they ever come for me, they would never be able to take me away. I would resist until they had to kill me. That's how much he wanted to stay with his, his flock. Think of that zeal in him. I'll talk a little bit again, a little bit more about his morning. Just a second. Finally, let's talk a little bit about his spiritual life, a little bit about his prayer life. One of the seminarians that was with him in, in Mount St. Mary's made this observation. Whenever I saw Stan in the chapel, he was always awake. <laughs> yes, you know exactly, yes. Yeah. yeah, that's not easy to do, right? He, he said that at, at that time, the seminarians, the, the, uh, the pews were in a choir um, kind of stalls, and so they faced each other, and then the, the, the altar was in front. So one seminarian, he said, was on this side looking across, and he said, I was always falling asleep at the holy hour in the afternoon, and I would look across and I'd see Stan there, and he was always awake. He was always awake. Monsignor Phillips, who had been president of Mount St. Mary's University, and then became the director of the Grotto of Mount St. Mary's, said that Stan had a tender devotion to the Blessed Mother. And whenever Stan would come to Monsignor Phillips and ask for his prayers so that he could persevere and finish the seminary, Monsignor Phillips would reply, Stan, don't worry. Love is going to pull you through. 
Archbishop Flynn remembered Stan this way. He said, he had a prayerful presence before the Lord. I was envious of the real gift of prayer that Stanley had. He was in touch with God immediately when he entered the chapel. When he had to decide what to do, whether to return or not, what does he do but turn to prayer? Five days at Mount St. Mary's on retreat. And with a deep interior life. Now, let's talk a little bit about his martyrdom. The 24 hours uh, of the last, the last day of his life. Father Don Wolf, his cousin, says this. Stanley was a passionate, driven person. He may have been soft-spoken, but underneath was steel. If he stayed behind in Oklahoma, where it was safe, and watched from a distance while other people suffered, that would have been a life less for him than to go back to remain their shepherd. He didn't go back to Guatemala to die. He went back to Guatemala to live. The day before his martyr, July 27, 1981, the Carmelite sisters spoke to him about a blood drive they were organizing. And so Stan, Professor Stanley Rother, signed up to give blood early in the morning of July 28th to contribute to the blood drive. That night, the sisters also spoke to him about the bloodshed in the village and the number of people who were being kidnapped and killed and left out uh, for their relatives to find them. And one of them said, Padre, what should we do if they come for you? In other words, what should we do if you are to shed your blood? Father Rother replied, go to the church, light the Easter candle, and sing resurrection songs. He went to bed that night. He had been for the last several weeks going to bed in different rooms in the complex of the parish because he knew that they were looking for him. He was hoping to avoid being found. Around 2 a.m. in the morning of July 28, 1981, three masked men made their way inside the nighttime silence of the church complex and went upstairs to what they thought was the priest's bedroom. Stan was living the sleeping downstairs. They found upstairs, however, a young Guatemalan man who was the brother of the assistant pastor. And this man was sleeping in the rectory for his own protection, reasoning that he would be least likely to be taken from there than from his hometown. So they find this young man, this Guatemalan young man. They take him out of the hallway and they put a pistol to his head and demand that he show them the room of the priest. So he led them downstairs to the door of Father Rother's room. As they stood there, one of them whispered to this young Guatemalan man, tell him there's a bomb in the house. But in a burst of great conviction that seems to define the Guatemalan character, he said, Padre, they've come for you. And in a moment of decision, which seemed to indicate that Blessed Stanley Rother had found the answers to his questions that he had on retreat at the Mount, and probably also to protect his house guest, he unlocked his door. They rushed in, slamming the door behind them. There was a struggle. They wanted to drag him out, beat him, kill him, and leave him for dead in a place where people would not find him. But there was a struggle. The young Guatemalan man heard the struggle. And then two gunshots. One bullet entered Stan's chest, another his head. 
He did not need to keep his appointment at the clinic that morning to give blood. He was giving all of it at that moment for his people. The sisters found his body. They brought his body into the church. They lit the Easter candle and they sang resurrection songs. An elderly Zutahil woman remarked, they killed our priest. He was our priest. He spoke our language. The people of Santiago Atadlan mourn the loss of their pastor and their friend. And because of the affection and veneration of his parishioners, they requested that Father Rother's heart be kept in Guatemala. And so his parents allowed for the heart to stay where it is still today, buried, and you can see the spot in the picture on the right, buried under that plaque, that stone plaque. That's where his heart is buried. His heart has stayed with his people. When he was beatified in 2017, they wanted to be sure that now the relics were there, and they discovered that his heart was there, there were jars of his blood, and the shirt that he had on when he was martyred, still wet with blood. Some of that blood is the relic we have today, given by the bishop of the area of Santiago to one of our professors who knew he was from the Mount and said, this relic is from Mount St. Mary's Seminary. And that's the relic that we venerate today. In the morning of July 28, 1981, back in Oklahoma, a priest visited Stan's parents. When his father saw the priest coming to the front door, he suspected that he had bad news. Mr. Rother said, they didn't get him out of the house, did they? No, they didn't. They discovered marks on his knuckles, indicating that he did struggle with them before he was shot. So finally, I just want to talk very, very briefly about promoting the cause of Blessed Stanley Rothman. You have, I think most of you, the, the prayer card. You'll notice on that prayer card, in the front of it, You'll notice on the front of it, there is a, uh, there's a picture of Blessed Stanley Rother. It was the banner that was used at his beatification. In the corners of the prayer card are the four most important churches that influenced the life of Blessed Stanley Rother. So, on the prayer card, again, this was the banner that was unfurled at his beatification in 2017. There are, in the four corners, the four most important churches that influenced the life of Blessed Stanley Rother. Um, in the lower left-hand corner is his parish church of Holy Trinity in Okarchi. In the upper right and lower right are the two cathedral churches, one of Oklahoma City and the other of Tulsa. In the upper left, you will see a picture of the front of Mount St. Mary's Seminary. Because that chapel, St. Bernard's Chapel, inside the seminary, had a significant role to play in his formation in his life and eventually in his martyrdom, his, de his decision really to go back to Guatemala knowing that he would die. So what I'm saying is you know, we have a prayer that we could pray uh, asking for his beatification, that, I'm sorry, his canonization has already been beatified. Um, we can um, certainly ask for his intercession as a martyr. Blessed Sandy Rother did not need a miracle in order to be beatified, to be called blessed. But the Holy See and the Holy Father looked for uh, a miracle and accounted and, and 
verify a miracle in order for him to be canonized a saint. So we need a miracle. Wouldn't it be wonderful if it came from someone here, someone that you know, some intention that you think that there has to be a great intervention of God's grace? Pray through the intercession of Blessed Stanley Rother. His biographer, uh, Maria Scapolanda, said the beatification of Stanley Rother is a tremendous importance to, is of tremendous importance to all of us who are the body of Christ. The fact that a regular guy from a small town can hear God's call and say yes until it called for his martyrdom. We are not all called to be martyrs, but we are all called to answer that yes. One of the ways that we can promote the cause of any saint, but especially Stanley Rother, is that an ordinary person like you and me say yes to God's grace. Say yes to his call of discipleship. Say yes to being a saint. And so, I, I conclude, and I guess we're going to eventually pray this prayer, so I'll leave it up here. Um, let me just conclude once again to thank you for coming this evening very much. I'm sorry I spoke a little bit long, but uh, I'm very excited and sometimes I get a little emotional about Blessed Stanley Rothman. I knew nothing of him when I arrived at the Mount as rector. Uh, I now feel as though he's a special friend uh, and great intercession for me and for the seminarians at the Mount. I'd ask for your continued prayers from our vocations to the priesthood and that our vocations to the priesthood can look to Blessed Stanley Rother, as I think anyone can, especially our seminarians, to see a shining example of what it means to be a saintly priest. So again, thank you for your attention. Um, and I think now we will pray the prayer. Or... Yes, thank you.
have mercy, have mercy, the church with the life of your Jesus and martyr. Bless us, Heavenly Father. Grant that in Christ's intercession, this humble flock may reach where the brave shepherd has gone. Grant that your church may proclaim the saints in the universe, and you should be for us, the Christ of God. O faithful shepherd, blessed Stanley Rother is priest and missionary. You tilled the soil with your hands and invited Christ Jesus to till the soil of your soul. You became a sign of love of Christ, the good shepherd, for your people and blessed their lives by your ministry. You stood firm and did not run from danger, bringing glory to God and his church in your martyrdom. Blessed Stanley, obtained from the heart of Jesus. And pray for me, that I too may be a sign of Christ's love among his people. Teach me faithfully to till the soil of this life and the reality given to me by your Father. Unafraid to stay with those God has given me no matter the cost. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall, shall be, a world without end. Amen. Blessed Stanley Rother, pray for us. Blessed Stanley Rother, pray for us. Blessed Stanley Rother, pray for us. In just a minute, I'll ask Monsignor Baker to come up so that if you'd like, you may come up and venerate the relic. Uh, in these COVID times, uh, we're not going to kiss the relic, so if you just want to touch it with your hand, just say a brief prayer. Um, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight, uh, and I want to remind you that next Friday evening at 6.30 also, uh, Father Gene Ritz, who is the procurator for the cause of the cause of canonization for Father Walter Chiswick, who who up in Shenandoah uh, will be here to do a very similar presentation to what Monsignor Baker did for us tonight. And then uh, the third week in, uh, in March, we have Father Jonathan Kalish, who is the Supreme Chaplain and Director of Spiritual Services for the Knights of Columbus International, who will be here with us that entire week. Uh, he'll have a presentation on Wednesday night on Holy Father John Paul II, and then on the cause of canonization for Father Michael McGivney, who is the founder of the Knights of Columbus. On other days, uh, we'll have Mass here Monday night that week with Father Kalish preaching. And on Tuesday, uh, the Knights of Columbus will also lead us in John Paul II's Stations of the Cross. So once again, I thank you all for coming. And Monsignor Baker, thank you so, so much for making the ride. Uh, Monsignor had hoped that he was going to spend the night with his brother up in the thriving metropolis of McAdoo. But unfortunately, uh, Monsignor's administrative assistant down at the mound, her mother passed, and so her funeral is tomorrow. And so Monsignor is going to make a journey back to Emmonsburg tonight after he leaves. So we could also intercede to St. Christopher for his safe travels, but also, most especially, his ability to help us learn who Father Stanley Rother was and that he could become a big cause of our own holiness. So God bless.